dementia researcher with a blog and a rating. Open access, the story continues. In my September blog, I described the trials and tribulations of going for gold. In other words, open access publication. Well, I promised to update you, so here I go. I am delighted to report that the paper I wrote is now in the public domain, open access, in a journal with a relatively high impact factor by speech and language therapy research standards, 3.737, no less. I confess the payment for the open access costs was and is still smarting, but I am really pleased I stuck by my principles and got this done. Now, I do know that publication of the development of a complex intervention is perhaps a little less usual, but it is becoming much more important. Being transparent is vital. Putting all the work into the public domain to demonstrate the rigour with which an intervention has been developed is just as vital as actually demonstrating it works. It is only by describing the intervention in the most thorough way possible that we can ensure it can be replicated and the Medical Research Council guidance on developing complex interventions promotes this. But perhaps one of the most frustrating things about this paper were the two rounds of reviews and the three reviewers' comments which focus so significantly on the patient and public involvement component. Amongst the questions asked were what methods were used to undertake PPI, how was co-production undertaken and were the ethics and power balance considered in the PPI work? In the first instance, I felt rather conflicted here. PPI is by its very nature a collaboration, an opportunity to share and work on things jointly with people with experience. Ideally, these people should be equally reflected in the author list to demonstrate this. Sadly, this wasn't possible in this journal, but the collaborative approach was undertaken with rather than on or to these people, so I hadn't exactly collated data from them. The process of discussion and co-production was a mutual one. We jointly decided what to do and when, and I didn't have the space to describe in detail the tasks we undertook. But equally, I didn't really want to publish the process in typical research-led format, allowing the PPI work to become research data. What was I able to do and, sorry, what I was able to do and what my PPI group had always emphasised was to foreground that with support with people with communication difficulties and dementia, can participate in equal partnerships as PPI collaborators. So I took the opportunity to describe and highlight the important role they played in the co-production of the intervention and to be specific about the communication supports and strategies and those methods that we used to enable this participation. In the meantime, I have co-edited a book with a speech and language therapy colleague and friend, Catherine Broomfield, on involving people with seldom heard voices in the PPI process. By editing the book, we've been able to include those PPI collaborators as authors in the book. We've been able to foreground their voices and co-produce a practicable resource for researchers to use in the future. We've also had the opportunity to share the stories of this research in a different way. We've also recently presented this work at a conference, our first invited keynote, no less. We were able to thereby amplify the voices of our PPA collaborators in that conference presentation using video and images to share the work we have done together. In summary, I always benefit from a reminder that it isn't only the peer-reviewed journal publications that are important. In fact, the other things, including these blogs, are just as valuable and just as important. Thank you for listening. Join the Dementia Research bloggers and share your own views.